My name is Celia Lacayo, and I'm the Associate Director of Community Engagement for the UCLA Social Sciences, and I also teach in the African American Studies and Chicano Studies Department. Um, today we have Karina Ramos, um, who graduated from UCLA in 99, um, the UCLA alumni, and she is now currently a staff attorney at the Immigrant Defenders Law Center, doing critical work with asylum seekers um, in this very uh, uh, critical time during COVID. Hi, Karina. Uh, how are you? ¿Cómo estás? How's everything? I'm good, Celia. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you. Um, so we'll jump right in. Can you tell us in general, what is the type of work you do at Immigrant Defenders Law Center and um, what is your role? I'm a staff attorney, as you mentioned, with the Children's Representation Project, CRP, at Immigrant Defenders Law Center. We are a social justice law firm that's predominantly based downtown in Los Angeles. Although we do have offices in you know, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino, where a lot of our clients live and a lot of the shelters are. Uh, we represent immigrant children who are in shelters, who are in federal long-term foster care, or children who have been released to sponsors within the jurisdiction of the Los Angeles uh, Immigration Court. Um, Technically, I'm an immigration lawyer. In order to fully represent our children, I'm often in front of a family law judge trying to get custody orders for the children. If they're not here with parents, if they are here with parents, we are also in front of the probate, uh, in front of the probate court getting guardianship orders for our children. We represent the children in front of the asylum office when they're interviewed for their asylum applications. We're in front of USCIS, the Department of um, Immigration and Citizenship Services, as well as obviously being their attorney and their representative in immigration proceedings in Los Angeles. So we hear a lot in the um, news about unaccompanied minors and asylum seekers. Can you tell us what is unique about these um, cases at this point in time? Well, there's with COVID going, going on right now, it's very, very critical how it's affecting our children. There are a couple things that are unique about both, I wanna tell you our law firm and the philosophy about how we represent the children as well as our clients themselves. Immigrant Defenders Law Center is one of the few law firms in the country that believes in universal representation. We follow sort of the public defender model, model where we believe that everybody deserves to be represented in court especially the most vulnerable in our society, which are the children. So we don't evaluate a case before we take it on. If we are appointed to be their representatives, we will represent the child through the entire proceedings. And if at the end, unfortunately, the result is that we were not successful in obtaining relief for them and they are de to be deported, we will hold their hand throughout the entire proceeding. Um, especially children are most disadvantaged when they have to go to court and represent themselves. The majority of the children that I represent come from what we call the Northern Triangle of countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. Our children don't speak English and some of them, the ones that come from Guatemala especially, don't even speak Spanish. So you can imagine entering a system that is already so complex and um, scary for them and there are children who are in court right now today without representation. So we are unique in that way that we represent everybody regardless of how strong their claim is. Um, secondly, our children are what we call UACs. The government has classified them as a UAC, that's an unaccompanied alien child. We don't like to use that term. We just call them UCs, unaccompanied children. And they're unique in that they come to the border, maybe with a family member, a cousin, a brother, an uncle. But when they get to the border, they're under 18, obviously. They have no legal status, no way to prove that they can be in the United States. And they showed up at the border without a legal guardian or a parent. So the government, in their attempt, rightly so, to determine that uh, this child may be at risk, this adult who's with them may be a trafficker, may be a coyote, they don't know who they are. So what they will do is they will separate the child from this adult and classify them a unit, unaccompanied alien child. And um, 
send them to a shelter. And that's at the point where our organization, there are a few of us, um, different organizations, but our organization gets appointed at the shelter stage. And that's when we begin representation of these children who are mostly here without their parents. Um, you and I have talked personally about how this is very near and dear to you and how you yourself feel very connected to um, the children that you're advocating and representing. Can you tell us perhaps about a particular case where in which the outcome was a positive one and you know something that you wanna share with us to kind of really highlight the humanity um, of, of the children and their experiences? Absolutely, as a matter of fact, I just had a case, um, let's call him Alex. He just turned 18 and that's a crucial point for our children. Our children, when they are about to turn 18, can lose a lot of protections that the immigration um, process affords them. So it's very critical when we are representing a new client, if they're close to turning 18, that we do a lot of things quickly to make sure that we safeguard these protections for them. Alex came from El Salvador. He was escaping a life of uh, extreme violence, especially as it relates to gangs. His brother was murdered for refusing to join um, the MS-13 gang in El Salvador. And he was approaching the age where he was being recruited himself and having witnessed the murder of his brother, he knew that either he left the country or he was gonna have the same fate as his brother. So he made the trek to the United States through El Salvador, through Guatemala, through Mexico uh, with his cousin who was an adult and they reached the border and like I explained to you before because this cousin was not his legal guardian and obviously not his parents they were separated at the border and Alex was sent to a children's shelter his cousin was sent to an adult detention center and uh, Alex became my client and of course, the moment you get a client, a new client, the first thing you do is figure out their age because you know you have to move quickly if they are close to turning 18. Alex was three months away from turning 18 when I got him. He had no potential sponsor, which means that in Los Angeles, in California, in all of the United States, there was nobody to, uh, there was nobody that the government would approve, let me put it that way, to be released, um, to release Alex to anybody. There was a cousin, but she did not have the proper documentation. A lot of um, the sponsors, you can imagine, are very fearful of presenting themselves to the government and asking to sponsor a relative because they themselves most likely are undocumented and are fearful of having ICE officers show up at their house to do checks or possibly getting into um, any sort of problems themselves. There was a cousin that he had, but it was, um, she was not approved as a sponsor. So she stayed in the background and he, at his 18th birthday, was going to be handcuffed and shackled and transported to an adult detention center. So I had to move quickly in order to try to prevent that from happening. Um, Alex and I went to court and it's complicated, but I basically argued to the judge that because he was a minor, he had been served improperly with certain paperwork and it worked, we were successful. I was able to terminate his proceedings and um, after three or four days of arguing with the shelter and explaining to them, because this is not often that this happens, that because deportation removal proceedings had been terminated against Alex, that they no longer had jurisdiction to keep him at the shelter and he should be released to his cousin. And um, like I said, it took about four days of back and forth with the shelter, but at the end, the shelter and the ICE officer who works from the shelter, agreed that they couldn't hold Alex and uh, his cousin came, picked him up and he's now safely at home with her. I'd have to say that this happened uh, about a week before everything shut down for COVID. Um, but had he not had representation, had he not been afforded a lawyer, he could have been in court by himself. And it was absolutely sure. It was There was no question in my mind that he would be currently at a COVID infested adult detention center. And the one that he would have gone to would have been Adelanto, which is in Adelanto, California. So that's just an example of how advocating, how having a lawyer with you in court just saved him. He was petrified. He was choosing 
to go back to El Salvador to a life of certain death, probably, if he refused to join the gang, than to go to an adult detention center because he's a child. And it's impossible for us to imagine that one minute he's considered a child and he's able to be in a, a, at a child shelter with all the safety that that entails. And the day he turns 18, doesn't matter if it's a Saturday or Sunday, the ICE officers would come in, handcuff him and transport him to an adult detention center. So that's, that's something that I'm very proud of. I feel very fortunate to have been able to be there for him for that. Um, but just to put things into perspective, our government in 2019 held in detention about 70,000 of these children. And there aren't that many of us lawyers to represent them. So it's, it's a crucial work that's being done for the kids. So it's very, it's very critical that the work and that the work that the center is doing is in fact saving um, folks' lives. And so I think it's really important to highlight this. Um, I wanna kind of, uh, you had mentioned before that COVID-19 is having an impact on everything. Um, how has it been impactful uh, for you um, at, at the court level, at, at the immigration center level? It's been devastating. Um... First and foremost, these are children. A lot of them, like I told you, we talked about, uh, have made the trek by themselves. Not all of them. A lot of them come with family, friends. A lot of them have come by themselves and they've come escaping horrible violence and trauma in their home countries. And so it's really important for me to be able to talk to a child, to meet with my clients, to see them face to face, to establish um, some sort of relationship so that they can trust me. If they can't trust me and tell me their story, I can't help them. I need to be able to take all those details and put them on some sort of application to submit to the government. So first and foremost, uh, shelters have been shut down. Our offices have been shut down. I am now working from home. So it's impossible to establish that relationship with clients. I, I just received a brand new client three days ago. She's a little girl from Mexico and she's eight years old. And I can't wait to beat her, but it's gonna be a while before I can see her. So in the meantime, I'm really saying hello, but there's nothing that's gonna happen legally for her because we don't have that relationship yet. Who am I? She's not going to trust me. So that's the main thing right now is that we don't have that one-on-one um, -on -one, um, relationship with our clients right now. Um, legally, the courts are closed. I can't go into a family court. I can't go into probate court. There are certain cases, like I mentioned, when our kids are gonna turn 18, there are emergency situations where we must obtain certain orders. And it's possible still, although very difficult, to go into court and get some sort of orders right now, although it's very, very difficult. <laughs> Immigration court has basically been shut down with the exception of children's court, the detained docket, we call it. Um, this administration is still prioritizing the deportation of detained children. so. So although most immigration courts and proceedings have stopped, um, every Thursday I still have to uh, make a telephonic court appearance on behalf of my detained children because as much as we are begging the government to stop proceedings against our clients, at least during this time, it is unfair for them to not be present in court with their lawyer. Uh, the government refuses to do so. So that's problematic. We are still continuing to appear in court for our clients over the phone on Thursdays. At the border, the process of seeking asylum has basically halted. There is no such proceedings currently. We are a country that has a wonderful, rich history of welcoming immigrants and asylum seekers. And currently that is not happening at the border. As a matter of fact, children are not even allowed to present their claim at the border. They are, they are um, investigated to see what country they're from. They are put on planes and they are returned immediately to, to their home country. So it's barbaric what's going on. It's, it's catastrophic. These children, we have to remember, are escaping real, real bad situations. And right now there is no asylum process. Um, the asylum office where our children receive their interviews is completely shut down. So I've had a, a slew of, of interviews that have been canceled and rescheduled because the immigration office feels, the asylum office, I'm sorry, feels that they're gonna begin interviewing again and then everything gets canceled again. So it's definitely slowing everything down. When I don't submit an application for a kid, for one of my clients, it could be I'm delayed two months, three months, but in real time, when they get their application actually approved, 
the wait time for them to actually get a visa could be pushed back two to three years based on a two to three month delay in filing their application now. So there are real life consequences for these children that are happening because of, of coronavirus and all the shutdowns. I think you've really um, talked about how this is very critical um, in reflecting, again, the type of uh, country we are, the kinds of values that we have. And I think in, you know, you're offering these perspectives that we are not seeing in, in other media places. Um, and so how, however people may think about the, the issue, I think what you've brought about is thinking about the humanity of these children and our response as a country. So the last question I have for you, Karina, is um, how can people support asylum seekers? What are things folks can do um, to really help um, the, these children um, who, again, deserve our help? And second of all, think about you know, how that really reflects uh, our country's values. I don't recognize this country right now and our values. It's it's taken a turn in a direction that's very dark. Um, I I returned back to work after a hiatus because I felt so strongly and passionately about representing children, especially the most vulnerable people in our in our society, and I couldn't stand around and watch what this administration was doing to to these children. Um, I told you the story of Alex, but I have a million others that could make you cry and, and laugh. And these children are the most resilient, the strongest, the most courageous children filled with grit. This country, I will tell you, would be a better, stronger place if they were allowed to stay. Absolutely, 100%, I feel that. I know them. I hear their stories. They look at us and they're so grateful to be here, even though they've been through such horrific things. They, they, they smile, they're so happy to be here. They're so grateful. They're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, what can we do? What can we do? If you feel passionately about protecting these children, we have to, I know these are things that are said all the time, but you have to go out and vote. You have to vote in an administration that is welcoming to immigrants, that is welcoming to children, that believes in our values of, of um, openness and accepting immigrants, which is how we were founded. That's really important. Um, go to law school. Go to law school. There's, there's, I, I need so much help. We need so much help. We need so many lawyers, lawyers who speak Spanish, but more importantly, lawyers who are passionate and want to help these children. There's not enough of us. There's never enough, enough of us. We have to turn away children all the time because they're just, we don't have the capacity. I currently have a, a caseload of 44 children that I represent and it's overwhelming. Um, so definitely go to school and join us if, if you feel that this is something that you want to do. And um, lastly, lastly, you know, donate. If you can't be a lawyer now, but you can help at all, then donate to my organization, Immigrant Defenders Law Center. There's a million organizations that you can help um, so that they can hire more lawyers to, to help these children. And lastly, a real, real thing that you can do is come to court on Thursdays. Right now it's closed, right now nobody can go, I can't go, but we have a we have the detained docket every Thursday at 606 Olive Street in downtown and it's open to the public. And you can sit there for 30 minutes if you want and you can watch me and watch other lawyers represent children. Children who are so little, sometimes that their little feet are dangling on the chairs, they can't reach the floor. And you'll see children who walk into court without lawyers and you'll see what a horrific thing that is because a child walking in unrepresented to immigration proceedings is an absolute um, recipe for failure. So come see us, come observe, come see for yourself um, what this administration is doing and what we're trying to do to, to combat it and, and help these children. Well, we can't thank um, Karina enough for her time today, seeing the critical work that she does, that really fighting for due process and fighting for the very values of our community at this time. Um, so I wanted to say thank you so much. And again, my name is Celia Lacayo, and we are signing off from UCLA Social Sciences. Mm -hmm.